Hey guys, it's Vince. Today in this video, we're taking another look in the series that I've created. This is now the fourth part, and this system is not a plasma system controller. This is a regular router controller, but the premise is the same. So I want you once again to take notes on what we're looking at, and I think there's still a lot to learn. I hope it helps some of you. Let's jump right in. Part one of the series. All electronics are housed on a slide which is mounted in the bottom cabinet. Okay, guys. Not much I really have to delve into here to see there is some major issues here. Uh, first and foremost, something that we've already previously discussed earlier in the series, this individual is mounting all of his electronics on a flammable piece of wood inside another cabinet made out of wood, which, again, logic with this is out the window. I do not understand why one would put their life and family's life at risk doing this. Um, something else to point out here is that we see this used a lot with these uh, surge protectors, power strips. Uh, basically, what these end users are doing, they're trying to split power, and I understand that. The issue is we see a VFD plugged into the same power strip as his electronics. So what do you think is going to happen when this VFD reaches its peak amp rating and it's going to naturally affect whatever breakers attached to this surge protector? I doubt the individual actually looked to see if this surge protector was able to handle the amount of power draw. on top of the fluctuation in power draw that's going to naturally affect all of his sensitive electronics. Now, as we look here, we do see a ground bar, and I'm going to let him explain why he installed it, but we really need to discuss this more because we're seeing this done more and more in the CNC world. This stuff has all been covered before. CNC 10 years ago did not have the amount of resources we see today. When I see this being done, it tells us that the end users are really not even researching the topic to the level they should. They're trying to make things simple for themselves, and then they try to pass on the information. And unfortunately, if you're a novice and you're trying to do this correctly, you see bad habits like this, dangerous habits, more importantly, that can lead to utter devastation in catastrophic terms if, of course, a spark or a short circuit happens, but in more common terms, just system instability. So let's listen to what he says. That go into that level of detail has a great series of videos on how to wire this thing, and I highly recommend them. It looks a lot more complicated than... Wiring electronics, once again, in terms of connecting leads from point A to point B or a specific terminal is not the same as building a system correctly for stability and more importantly, safety. Keep that in mind, guys. This, mainly because there are four of the motor controllers. So there's these wires are all uh, multiplied by four. So it looks a lot more complicated than it actually is. But what I will go through is a couple of things that I found that are quite important to uh, take into consideration. Again, let's go through the things that are here. This unit here is the VFD, which controls the spindle. This is the controller for the X motor. First of all, these are not controllers. Once again, the end user is not aware of what hardware he's really using. These are drivers, guys. Each driver is allocated to a specific axis. The controller would be over here. The controller actually takes and delegates signals from your PC and then spreads those signals to the correlated driver for a specific axis to produce automation. So let's make sure we're talking with the right terminology, and terminology comes from two things, experience and knowledge. Let's continue. This is a controller for the Y motor, this is a controller for the Z motor, and this is a controller for the A motor, which is slaved along with the Y motor, and they run in parallel with each other. Then below this here is the Mach 3 board, which is the interface to the computer. Over here is the 48 volt supply, and over here is a 24 volt supply. Once again, if we come back just ever so slightly, we can look at our terminal connections here, and you can see he's got two terminals, 
And these are crimp terminals, which I highly recommend not using because crimps, and I've said this before, each crimp is individually different. Some make great conduction, some do not, and they can naturally cut conductors of the lead you're attaching them to. Needless to say, each terminal on a power supply, especially a switching power supply commonly used in association with CNC, is designed for a single terminal. You see multiple terminals now being jumpered. That is incorrect. That is because the individual once again does not understand the terminal splitting, which simply means we use a terminal similar to what we see here, and you have one lead come over to this terminal, basically adding additional terminal spaces. This is how you can easily see if someone understands electronics or they do not. And why I say that is essentially what they end up doing is making a correlated mess when it doesn't have to be, it would be much more organized to have a single lead come over to this terminal and by doing so they've split the terminal and then all they do is run individual leads coming to this and it keeps everything extremely neat. Now saying that is something that is easy to do. Doing it takes more time and henceforth more time, more money because he needs more terminals and that's typically why we do not see it done. That or the fact they do not have the knowledge to do so. Before volt supply. The other thing that is included in here is a remote panel for the VFD, which are mounted on the front panel of the cabinet, and it is connected by this flat ribbon cable that was supplied with the VFD. Now, another thing, guys, and I've discussed this in previous videos, but I'm going to keep drilling it into everyone's head. And that is that if the VFD is mounted in close proximity to your sensitive electronics, all of that EMI from this unit, is being correlated right around here. And let's look at something once again, which is extremely important to discuss. He's got the controller, which is USB based, which again is extremely sensitive to virtually any electromagnetic interference, let alone grounding. He's got it directly within inches of the VFD. Now, what's funny is HY's user's manual does discuss how to actually mount their units in terms of proper mounting with grounding and dissipation of EMI. In no regard to that user's manual would you ever see them mounting it in conjunction to the enclosure right like this. If you are going to mount a VFD in an enclosure, it should be metal so it acts as a Faraday cage. And once again, it should not be in direct vicinity of your electronics. Uh, optimally, you're looking at five to six feet of distance. The more distance we have between our electronics, regardless of shielded cabling being used, the less EMI actually uh, causing any signal disruption as long as we keep that distance at bay. Now, I would never, ever recommend just adjusting distance. Always use the proper cabling. I have certain clients uh, that have asked me in the past if they could actually just mount the VFD farther away, and that will work to some extent, but it's not going to produce that bulletproof stability that you're looking for. Once again, if you're trying to do it once and be done with it, I recommend using the proper cabling and, of course, incorporating the distance, and you guys will be very happy with the results. Lastly, there is this cable here, which is a parallel port cable, which connects the computer to the Mach 3 board. One thing you'll notice is that I have, in a couple places here, mounted the grounding strips. This is very critical. I read online that the cables can be subject to interference coming from the spindle. And so other people online highly recommended that these cables be shielded. And I did use a shielded cable, but at the beginning, I had forgotten to connect all of the shields to ground. And I had a number of problems in getting this system to run. The biggest problem I had was that Mach 3 would freeze, and it would just stop. Even though the computer was running fine, and the electronics on the board were running fine, Mach 3 would freeze. Well, first of all, listen to what he just said. And this is where we have a lot of confusion with end users that say, well, I hooked everything up right and the electronics were running, but everything froze. You didn't hook everything up right if everything froze. You just contradicted yourself. 
And again, what we're looking at is a man that's trying to explain what he did in turn of telling you he made a massive mistake. People that understand what they're doing don't ask what other people are doing because they're going to do their own research and look at true documented sources. They're not going to go in and go on forums and hope that some guy they've never met in another state, another country, another realm, a genre, and hope that he's going to give them the proper results. Don't be that guy. Be the person who goes online, goes to reputable sources, Go to Gecko Drive. Go to Lincoln Electric. Go to the companies that have already passed those hurdles and paid the people in a different skill set above yours to give you the knowledge. Because guess what? That's what they're paid to do. They're not going to supply you with incorrect knowledge. Yes, you're going to work harder. If you don't want to do that, you pay an engineer like myself and we'll get with you and we'll do it right. But doing this where you're hit and miss and you're hoping you get results, you hope you get stability, you hope that the guys online got you to where you need to be, that's a big gamble, isn't it? Especially when we're talking about safety. I mean, after doing all this research online that he openly admits, you mean nobody told you not to mount electronics on wood board? Are we to believe that? I don't know, guys. You, you'd be the judge on that. I'd love to hear comments on it. And I want to discover that I needed to make sure that all the shields for all the wires are indeed connected to ground and also that the cable interfacing between the computer and the Mach 3 board has these chokes at the end and one at each end. Once I replaced this cable and connected all the shields, I had no more trouble with the Mach 3 freezing and I've had no issues at all. No issues at all. And please define that. What do you mean no issues at all? Over what time duration? Are we to believe that that choke solved every problem in this controller, guys? I hope not. Because I'm telling you right now, if you're relying on a $30 USB board to control a multi-thousand dollar system, I think you guys are in for a lot of trouble as time goes on. Maybe he has not encountered any problems yet. And this is something that comes up a lot. When a controller is built like this, especially around a USB controller if you do not use proper grounding if you do not use the proper cabling and it, and it definitely delves deeper than just the proper size choke the odds of you having stability over 10 12 eight hour shifts that's a whole different realm than a guy sitting here with a wood board underneath his chassis and telling you he's corrected all his problems when you're looking at a bunch of them still existing right before us so think about that and really, really think hard, how many times do I want to do the same thing? Running the machine. The other issue that I had was the wiring that comes with the controllers and the stepper motors. Now remember, I bought stepper motors that have feedback control. The wiring that goes from the box, the control boxes to the motors is too short for the machine. Now, this is super interesting. I hope you guys picked up on what he just said. These controllers, which he means drivers, that have feedback control. Do you know what he's talking about? These are servos, guys. And he was having trouble with stability with servos. We don't hear this too often. We always hear steppers lose steps. We hear steppers have problems. Steppers are not as accurate. Steppers this and that. It's crap. Steppers and servos have the same accuracy. Check the screen. I'm putting a link there. One of the largest manufacturers of motors. I've discussed this in previous videos. Both servos and steppers have the same accuracy. Like it or not, it's fact. The other fact is, is that as I've discussed before, I don't care what kind of driver you're using. If the system is built incorrectly, you're going to have instability. And he just openly told you that. It pretty much tells you that every driver is at stake when things are built incorrectly. So I replaced all of them, and it requires two sets of wires. One is a four-conductor shielded wire, which is this gray cable here, and then the other is a six-conductor shielded wire, which is this white cable here. The four-conductor powers the motor. The six-conductor cable is the feedback controller. As you can see, I think it's important in, in a case like this to keep all your cables organized. I have them connected with little wire ties to the board just to keep things organized so I know 
where everything goes, and if there's a problem, I can always uh, diagnose. He can always diagnose it, which, again, if there's a problem to me as a logistical person doing this, as I've done it now professionally for over a decade, if I don't document and I don't have labeling done on everything, I don't know what I'm working on, guys. And I'm just telling you. And I don't care if this is the only system you're building. Take your time. Label everything as much as possible because when that time comes to service, you got to remember you're under stress. Not all the time will a machine not give you problems when you least expect it in terms of, oh, you got a client's project on the table. That's usually the time the machine will give you problems. You're under a time deadline. Now you've got to go back and remember everything you did. I'd much rather have that knowledge associated with each component on how I hooked it up so I can streamline this whole process of troubleshooting and get the machine running again. If you want to believe that this guy is not ever going to have problems with this and that now he solved all his problems, guys, please be very careful on where you're getting your information from. Once again, I don't feel he's trying to be malicious in dispersing the information. I do feel he's ignorant enough to believe that because he did this and wired this up the way he did, it still doesn't mean it's done correctly. And you can do your research online. Don't take my word for it. And you'll find out exactly why I get 15 to 20 retrofits a month because of things like this. When people see what's being done online, they naturally associate it with something being done correctly. We now know the difference. Hey guys, that wraps up this series now for the fourth part. I'll continue the series. The more I find, the more you'll know. And I still think there's a lot to learn from this. And hopefully more of you will continue to ask the right questions because again, we're seeing this done over and over again. And at least they'll get the guys that are more novice started on the right foot. Thank you all for your support. Take care.